If it is the case, then uh, they have serious problems here. Here's a bird, perfectly, well, it, a very modern bird, according to nature, that's half again as old, according to their estimates, as Archaeopteryx. Now, Archaeopteryx is supposed to lead to the birds, but the gar birds got their way before Archaeopteryx, according to this discovery. Looking again, we're told a paleontologist at Texas Tech University, as a Dr. Chatter Ch Chatterjee, found the fossil, says they have advanced avian features. Now, many have gotten real upset about this, but he's beautifully documented this in a very elaborately illustrated book, and uh, his case is well made and reported here in science. You've got birds before Archaeopteryx. How could Archaeopteryx lead to the birds? That's a, a real problem. And others have just reached the conclusion that they're really not that similar. Doug Douglas Fatumia, who is an anti-creationist, written several books against the creationist, admits in the Chronicle of Higher Education, or they're talking about him there, uh, that birds could not come from dinosaurs. They're just dramatically different. And here they report that Yale University released a landmark publication, this is in 96. The impetus for the book was the fact that dinosaur and origin of birds had become overnight the dogma in the field. And many of us from the ornithological side, that is the experts on birds, felt that it was simply wrong. He continues saying that birds descended from dinosaurs is utter nonsense. When you look at birds, you see the respiratory system, the circulatory system is just totally radically different. Uh, you see, yes, there are three uh, digits on the foot, but they come again from different parts of the embryo. They're not the same three digits. And that certainly argues then against a common origin for those three digits. W.E. Swenson sums up the evidence for birds from the fossil record in his book Comparative uh, biology and comparative physiology. He's from Cambridge, one of the leading experts in the world. He says, the origin of birds is largely a matter of deduction. There is no fossil evidence. What did he say? <laughs> no fossil evidence of the stages through which the remarkable change from reptile to bird was achieved. Now, we're talking about a revolutionary change. In many cases, hollow bones. We're talking about uh, a structure that allows birds to breathe in and then don't stop and turn around and breathe back out. It just continues to flow on out through their wings. They need a very efficient respiratory system, which they have. And likewise, the, uh, the, the rapid uh, blood flow is necessary, and so they have a totally different kind of heart. Now, here is a, a radically different revolutionary change that took place and how much evidence of, is there of this radical, dramatic change in the fossil record? The leading expert says, zip. Now, if you document evolution, uh, then you've got to show this progressive change, and you don't have it. If it happened this way, there ought to be some evidence. But the leading authorities say, nope, not anything, and Archaeopteryx can't, even Google acknowledges Archaeopteryx doesn't prove the point, it's just a curious mosaic, he says. And the leading experts say birds are totally different. Uh, it doesn't work, and you've got birds before Archaeopteryx. D.B. Kitts summarizes what we're talking about with the nature of the fossil record, when he says evolution requires intermediate forms. I mean, this is, how else would you see it? That's what it takes to show evolution in the fossil record. Between species and paleontology, does not provide them. How many times have you heard fossils prove evolution? Well, how would they do it? Showing intermediate forms change from one to the other. No. The leading authorities in the field here, writing in the journal Evolution, says paleontology does not provide them. He continues saying the fact that discontinuities, now it's continuities that show change and evolutionary progress, the fact that discontinuities are almost always and systematically present at the origin of really big categories is an item of genuinely historical knowledge. Now, writing in the journal Evolution tells you what he believes, but what the actual facts are, he acknowledges to be discontinuities, not just randomly caused by incomplete sampling, but systematically present. When you find something really different, you've got a gap. And we know that. That's genuine historical knowledge. In fact, D.S. Woodruff, University of California at San Diego, 
writing in science. Uh, he's the, a textbook author, well-known authority in the field, just fesses up. He says, fossil species remain unchanged. This is what Gould says. We know we don't see this change throughout most of their history, and the record fails to contain a single example. He's given up, evidently, on Archaeopteryx or on these links that are supposed to have led. Fails to contain a single example of a significant transition. Now, this is not a lightweight. This is one of the leading authorities, and likewise with S.M. Stanley, the paleontology department at Johns Hopkins, one of the leading authorities in the field, says, in fact, the fossil record does not convincingly document a single transition from one species to the other. Now, if evolution is proved by the fossil record, how would it be done? Well, showing a transition from one to the other. The leading authorities say they don't change, and it fails to document one transition. Wow. Again, if we were trying to write the stories of creationists, we couldn't have really done... <laughs> in fact, I wouldn't have been that bold. Now, they firmly believe this. These men, in spite of what it may sound like, believe devoutly, unquestionably, in evolution. The idea is expressed by A.C. Stewart this way. He says, the theoretical, theoretically primitive type eludes our grasp. Uh, our faith postulates its existence but the type fails to materialize. Now, they believe they're men of great faith. But as someone has said, uh, for the evolutionists, their faith is the substance of fossils hoped for and the evidence of links unseen. You don't see what you need to see in order to see evolution in the fossil record. But they believe it by faith. And it's a faith that's a blind faith in spite of the evidence, not because of it. And sometimes they even say that. Notice the statement by Niles Eldridge, the American Museum of Natural History, uh, their professor of geology, curator there of invertebrate paleontology, Gould's cohort, written articles together with him, says it has been the paleontologist, my own breed, who have been most responsible for letting ideas dominate reality. Now that's not the way it's supposed to work in science. The reality is what produces the ideas. No, here's the idea. We've let that dominate the facts, the reality. He says, we paleontologists have said that the history of life supports that interpretation. He's talking about the gradual change that's in all the textbooks. We've said that all the while knowing that it does not. And so we're looking not at just a blind faith, but there's a sense in which you could describe it as a dishonest faith, knowing that the evidence points in the other direction. They knew better, but they said it, because that's, of course, their faith, and they're committed to naturalism. One of the reasons why some of these men are willing to make such amazing acknowledgments of what is true is that they do think they have an answer to that, and uh, there is a response that's made to the kind of evidence that we've documented from the leading evolutionist. We're told the answer is punctuated equilibria. Oh, that sounds really impressive. And uh, Stephen Gould, together with Niles Eldridge, has promoted this idea. And uh, we'll allow Eldridge and Gould to comment on this in paleobiology. They say, in fact, most published commentary on punctuated equilibria has been favorable. We are especially pleased that several paleontologists now state with pride and biological confidence a conclusion that had previously been simply embarrassing. All right, now they can be proud they were embarrassed. What was it that embarrassed them? All these years, uh, all these years of work, and I haven't found any evolution. They don't have to be embarrassed about not finding any evolution anymore. They can now be proud because they've got the answer, punctuated equilibria. It's very similar to a concept that was espoused a number of years earlier, similar even according to Gould, as uh, Goldberg had proposed what he called the hopeful monster mechanism. And he just said, well, you look at the fossil record, you don't see this gradual change, and so mama reptile must have laid an egg and a bird hatched out. Uh, I'm sure that surprised uh, papa reptile. Uh, we know something about genetics that tells us this sort of thing doesn't happen. Most geneticists seem to think that uh, it was Goldsmith that laid the egg. Uh, 